So uh, typically what we do, and, and Graham, this is your first time here, so I'll just kind of uh, explain maybe a little more uh, what we do. Um, we begin with a guided meditation. Uh, so I take everybody through that. There's nothing you need to know in advance. You know, we just go through it together. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but uh, as we come together, usually we're coming from a busy day or a busy life. We have lots of things going on and sometimes we're carrying a little bit of anxiety or a little bit of tension. Uh, and so it's helpful to kind of recognize those things and to let go of them. So we do uh, what is known as just a purification process where uh, I invite everybody to just close their eyes, become present here, and become just generally aware of the feeling tone of your own body and your own mind. Mm -hmm. you know, are you feeling uh, tension? Are you feeling anxiety? Are you feeling stress? Or maybe frustration or even anger from some difficulty during the day. And one of the things that's helpful about looking for these things and taking note of them is that we really can put them down. We're able to just safely set them down, not ignoring them, but we're gonna work on ourselves for a period of time. So this is very helpful. So we do this purification of the mind letting go of anything that would be uh, having a root of greed or ill will or delusion. And with that, I'm just going to sound the bell, the temple bell. Let there be peace. Let there be peace. Namaskar, everybody. Welcome. Welcome. I'm glad everybody could make it who is here tonight. Summer is always, uh, it's always different. People uh, coming and going, vacations and things. So we'll begin with our meditation practice, guided meditation practice. So however you would like to be for that, whether it's sitting or laying, can get your body in a comfortable posture. If during the meditation practice, if you find that you're getting dozy, uh, feeling like you're gonna doze off uh, and you're laying down, then you might wanna just sit up for, for a couple of minutes. You can just sit up on your uh, cushion or you can get up in the chair. But if you start to feel drowsy, you may begin to snore. So it's, uh, it's helpful then to just sit up and then you're, um, usually you'll kind of uh, refresh that ability to stay awake for a few more minutes. So getting comfortable in your body, it is helpful to find symmetry in the body. Uh, make sure that both sides of the body are supporting your weight relatively equally. Let go of any obvious tension. You can let your eyes close softly if you're comfortable doing that. We close our eyes just to eliminate the visual distractions that, that might grab our attention. And then you can let the breath begin to flow naturally in and out through the nose. If your nose is stuffy or you don't breathe well through your nose, you can certainly breathe through your mouth, but if you can breathe through your nose, that is helpful for the practice as we continue. So with that, I'm going to sound the meditation bell. Just ask you to follow the sound of the bell. And then when it goes silent, I'll begin to guide us through the practice. Follow the sound of the bell as it fades into silence. And let the silence be an invitation to turn your senses inward. 
we can safely let go of the habit of the mind which is to be projected outward into the outside world and instead we can focus our attention on the inward feeling of presence just the feeling of being in your own body what it feels like to be sitting here or laying here what it feels like to be breathing what it feels like to be present and with that sense of presence established let's bring our awareness up to the top of the head and to the area of the scalp and for a few moments just focus your awareness on any physical sensations that you detect anywhere in your scalp so just physical sensations in the scalp you might notice them as temperature sensations a feeling of warmth or coolness sometimes that's an internal sensation in the body versus an external sensation in the room there is sometimes a sensation of air movement the air moving through the room across the hair there is sometimes a sensation on the surface of the skin a tingle or an itch or a tickle so just being aware of all these sensations as they come and go just pay attention notice them release them as they fade away and if you notice any tension anywhere in the area of the scalp any physical tension just release that very softly and gently let the tension go and continue to observe the physical sensations in the scalp and then from the scalp we will guide our awareness downward feel it moving downward into the forehead feel the awareness flowing downward into the temples feel it moving through the eyebrows and into the eyes and we're just observing the sensations in these parts of the body observing temperature observing air movement observing other subtle sensations on the surface of the skin and focusing on our sensations in this way if we become aware of any tension anywhere in the forehead or temples eyebrows or eyes we just release that tension very softly we just let it go sometimes we can smile at our tension as we release it knowing that we are setting our bodies free and then we continue to observe the sensations maintaining awareness in the forehead, temples, eyebrows, and eyes. And then from the temples, we can guide the awareness downward into the ears. And see if you can really feel that movement of awareness. There is a knowable sensation of movement as that awareness flows downward into the ears then it moves from the ears forward into the cheekbones and into the face and just stay with the sensations from the eyes let the awareness flow downward let it pass down through the nose and the lips and mouth and chin again just focus all of your awareness on these parts of the body and the physical sensations as they come and go. And there's nothing in particular that you need to be feeling. There's nothing that you shouldn't be feeling. You're just opening up awareness, being present. If there's any tension in the face, maybe in the jaws, maybe the teeth are clenched, sometimes the lips are pursed any tension you find in the face just allow that to leave the body continue to observe the sensations 
And as we begin to get a little deeper into the practice, you can start to let go of any of the thoughts about the sensations that you're experiencing. And just try to have the raw experience, just the feeling. Sensations in the body are this way now. Sensations in the body are this way now. And then from the chin, we can guide the awareness downward slowly into the neck. Feel it moving downward through the throat in front of the neck. Feel awareness flowing to the sides of the neck and the back of the neck. Just observe, be aware of the sensation. If there's any tension anywhere in the neck, anywhere in the muscles of the neck, just release. Let the tension go, release it softly. You're not trying to push away the tension with a sense of aversion, but it's more of a just a noticing and a releasing. Noticing and letting go. And then from the neck, we can guide the awareness downward into the shoulders. Begin to become aware of the sensations in the shoulders. If you're leaning against a chair or laying on the floor, you might notice the sensation of contact between your shoulders and the surface that you're touching. Sometimes there's a sensation of contact between your skin and your clothing. So you're just observing these sensations. Again, nothing special, nothing odd, just whatever you feel, whatever's there. Temperature, air movement, sensations on the surface of the skin, and those include contact. Let the shoulders drop if they're shrugged. Allow that tension to leave the body. And then you can begin to move the awareness downward into the upper arms. And spend a few moments with each part of the upper arms, just noticing and releasing. Bring awareness to the biceps, the front part of the upper arms. Noticing and releasing, remaining aware, and then rotating inward to the inside part of the upper arm. Following that simple process, just observing, knowing the sensations, letting the tension go, moving awareness around to the back of the upper arms, the triceps feeling them from top to bottom, letting the tension go, and then moving awareness to the outside part of the upper arms, observing the sensations, releasing the tension. It starts to become a more automatic process as we move through. It's just a knowing of sensation and a releasing of tension. Each part of the body, we repeat that process. Sometimes we use the phrase, know and let go. Know and let go. And then we can allow the awareness to flow downward through the elbows, feel it moving. And notice how it is this flow, this movement of awareness that draws our attention to these different parts of the body. We're cultivating an objective awareness of the sensations of the body. And then just a very gentle releasing of tension without any aversion or disliking. Feel the awareness flowing through the forearms and downward. Feel it moving into the wrists. Follow the awareness as it flows through the wrists, down into the hands. And then 
feel the different parts of the hands, the heels of the hands, and then the palms. Bring the awareness to the tops of the hands and the fingers. Observe the thumbs, just all the sensations in the hands, sensations as they come and go. Release any tension. Guide the awareness down to the tips of the fingers and become aware of the fingernails. For a few minutes or a few moments, just focus there. What are the sensations in the fingernails? Focusing here, remaining aware, and then we'll maintain a continuity of awareness as we make a move from the fingertips and the fingernails up to the top of the chest. So just bring your awareness to the top of the chest and to the collarbones. And then follow, observing very attentively as the awareness flows downward through the chest. Feel it as it moves downward, all the way to the base of the sternum. And then follow the awareness as it flows outward through the rib cage, illuminating all these different sensations. Just watching them come and go with objectivity, letting go of the tension. Become aware of the feeling of peacefulness as it overtakes your body. And now from the rib cage, we can guide the awareness up to the underarms and feel as the awareness flows downward through the sides of the body, downward further all the way to the waist, focusing awareness here just noticing the sensations and letting the tension go. And then from the waist, you can guide your awareness forward into your belly. And just be aware of the sensations in your belly. What are the sensations in the belly at this moment? Sensations of rising and falling with the breath sensations of expansion and contraction. Sometimes there are sensations of tension, the belly is constricted or tight. You can allow that tension to leave the belly and just be free and relaxed. And then from the belly, we'll maintain a continuity of awareness and we'll make the move around to the top of the back. So bring the awareness around and focus at the base of the neck on the back. And let the awareness flow downward a bit through the shoulder blades. Feel it moving through the upper third of the back. Feel the sensations and let the tension go. Allow the awareness to flow downward through the middle third of the back. Again, just observing the sensations as they're illuminated by awareness. Maintaining an objectivity, not being partial to one sensation over another. Just observing, letting the tension leave the body observing as the awareness flows downward into the lower part of the back now. Observing, letting the tension go. Sometimes we encounter sensations in the body that are difficult for us or that we don't like. Sometimes we encounter pain or fatigue. And when we encounter these difficult sensations, the habit is often to generate a little aversion towards them, a little disliking, a little not wanting. And when we generate these negative states of consciousness, 
we find that there can be kind of a coagulation in the awareness. The awareness doesn't want to flow and the tension doesn't want to leave. But if you have any pain in your back, just allow extra spaciousness for those difficult sensations or for the pain to be just as it is. You find that you really have quite a bit of room within your expansive awareness that these sensations can come and go as they will and that you can be present without reacting to them with negativity. And by doing this, you're actually cultivating equanimity. You are not reacting with negativity, but you are moving into peacefulness. You are moving into calm stability. And now from the lower back, guide your awareness downward into your sit bones. Feel it moving through your hips and feel it expanding through the pelvis now. Again, just be aware of the sensations. Really let this be the thing that your awareness is focused on sensations in the body and if there's tension just release it soften the body and let the tension go and then we can continue to move downward moving the awareness into the thighs and we'll focus on the different parts of the thighs starting with the top surface from the tops all the way down to the knee joints, observing the sensations, letting the tension go, and then rotating outward to the outside surface of the thighs. Just being aware of the sensations, letting tension go, rotating to the underside of the thighs, observing and releasing and then rotating once again to the inside surface of the thighs from the tops all the way down to the knees and then feel as the awareness begins to flow through the knee joints feel that soothing movement of awareness flowing downward into the calves Feel it moving through the shins. Continue to observe as it moves downward through the ankles. And again, in each of these parts, there's just an objective awareness of sensation, neither liking nor disliking, just aware and just letting go of tension as you find it and guide the awareness through the ankles and down into the feet now. Spend a moment with the heels and the sensations there. And then moving to the soles of the feet and the sensations there. If there's any tension in the feet, you can allow them to rest, allow them to flatten become aware of the balls of the feet and then bringing awareness around to the top of the feet and feel as it moves down begins to pass through the toes moving through the toes and finally into the toenails and just observe the sensations there for a few moments find that sometimes it takes a few moments just paying attention waiting for sensations to be known by awareness and then sometimes you'll discover a very subtle sensation of energy pulsation from the toenails now we'll move again we'll move once again up to the top of the head and to the area of the scalp and this time, at your own pace, 
you can begin to guide your awareness back down through your body. But as you move, try to follow about the same path that we followed together so that each part is getting the attention of your awareness. Move through, be aware of the sensations in each area once again. Be aware of the tension and release it. As you discover places in the body where tension seems to become present over and over, you'll find this tension reappearing after just releasing it a couple of minutes ago. These are the places where we habitually hold tension in the body. And we do it as a reaction to tension or to stress or to difficult experiences. And so by becoming aware of these places where tension exists, we can release and we can let go of the remnants of the difficult emotions that cause them. You know, for example, if at some point during the day, if you were uh, worried about something that was causing you anxiety or tension, you know, you'd hold that in the body. And later on, you'd find that that tension in the body is kind of causing the difficult emotions to continue. They sort of echo in a way. So each time we find this tension, we can let it go, begin to set ourselves free, and we can begin to cultivate a new positive habit energy just knowing and releasing, knowing and letting go. And now, as you've had a chance to move your awareness back down through the body, all the way to the feet, let's bring the awareness together up to the base of the nose. Focus your awareness on the little patch of skin beneath your nostrils and above your upper lip. And then you can focus your awareness just a little bit further to include the rings of the nostrils. And then you can expand your awareness just a bit further to include the nasal passages. So we have this triangular area of the nose and we will stay here focusing all of our awareness on the movement of the breath as it moves in through the nose and as it moves out through the nose. Be fully aware of the movement of the breath. Breathing in, you're aware that you're breathing in. Breathing out, you're aware that you're breathing out. And try to keep your attention on the breath for the full duration of each in-breath Stay with it as it begins, as it slows and pauses, and then it reverses direction, becoming the out-breath. We stay with the out-breath, stay with it as it slows and pauses, then it becomes the next in-breath. So we maintain this continuity of awareness on the breath, we stay with the movement of the breath for its full duration in and for its full duration out. You might even notice that some in-breaths are longer, some are shorter, some breaths are deeper, some are more shallow. You might even notice how sometimes there's more air moving through the left nostril or maybe more air moving through the right nostril, or perhaps air moving equally through both of the nostrils. As you're observing the movement of the breath, open up your awareness to the feeling of touch. Still within this triangular area of the nose, anywhere the breath passes, 
become aware of the feeling of touch. And as you observe that feeling of touch, you can open up to more of the subtleties of the breath while breathing in. You may notice that the air feels a bit cooler. Breathing out, you might notice that the air feels just a bit warmer. And breathing in, you might notice the air is a little bit drier. And breathing out, the air is a little more moist. So we have all of these aspects of the breath to focus on. Staying within the triangular area of the nose, remaining aware of the movement of the breath in and out, remaining aware of the touch of the breath, remaining aware of the sensations of the breath. And as we stay focused here, more than likely there'll be moments of distraction where there'll be a sound in the room or a sound outside the building and momentarily we'll find our, our attention is drawn to it away from the breath and in the moment that you notice that distraction taking place simply guide your awareness back to the triangular area of the nose just let go of the distraction whatever it is Return to the breath and just refocus again on the movement and the touch and the sensations of the breath. And the sounds would just dissipate on their own. They need no further effort. Sometimes we'll experience distraction in the form of physical sensations in our own bodies. Sometimes there's a feeling of restlessness and a desire to move, or sometimes there's a, a tickle or an itch or a dull sensation. Again, the practice is upon noticing these distractions that we don't get upset or we don't develop aversion, but we just gently bring the awareness back to the breath. Let go of the sensations and just focus on the breath, the triangular area of the nose, the movement and the touch and the sensations of the breath as it comes and goes. We have this perfect object of meditation always with us. Sometimes we'll find that the mind wanders though and is distracted by memories or images or thoughts. And in the same way, noticing a distraction like this, the practice is to gently return the awareness to the nose, the triangular area of the nose, and focus on the movement of the breath and the touch and the sensations of the breath. So this is the practice of cultivating equanimity, remaining focused on the breath and not reacting to any distraction other than to, upon noticing the distraction, returning to the breath and refocusing. So let's do this together for just a few minutes in silence. I won't guide us any longer. Just remain in silence, focused. Try to remain still in the body. Focus on the breath. And in just a few minutes, I'll sound the bell to end this meditation.
meditation. Feel free to stand up or stretch or walk around a little bit. Change positions. And we'll take a break for about a minute as we get ready to uh, do our uh, talk for tonight. Um, there is tea in the kitchen if anybody is interested, uh, or water, of course, but there's tea in there. And uh, I moved it um, to a different spot. You'll see where it is, but help yourself. Or if you want water, you can get a cup of water. And um, if you want to have any uh, light on, feel free. So you can read, but you don't have to. So I thought I'd share a little story while we're transitioning from the meditation to the Dhamma talk. And uh, this is from a book uh, by my teacher. And um, this is just a, a short story from it. Um, and this is from the life and time of the historical Buddha. And uh, this one is entitled, Nothing But Seeing. There lived a recluse near where Bombay now stands, which is now Mumbai. Uh, this recluse was a very saintly man, and all who met him revered him for his purity of mind, and many claimed that he must be fully liberated, fully enlightened. And hearing himself described in such high terms, naturally this man began to wonder, Perhaps I am, in fact, fully liberated. But being an honest person, he examined himself carefully and found that there were still traces of impurities in his mind. Surely, as long as impurities remained, he could have not reached the stage of perfect saintliness, he thought. So he asked those who came to pay respects to him, Is there not anyone else in, this, in the world today who is known to be fully liberated? And they responded, oh, yes, sir, uh, there is a monk, Gotama, and this was the uh, family name of the historic Buddha, Siddhartha Gautama. Uh, but there is this monk, Gotama, called the Buddha. The word, the Buddha, Buddha is not a name, Buddha is a title, it means one who is awake. But, uh, so this person lives in the city of Savati, and he's known to be fully liberated, and he teaches the technique by which one can achieve liberation. And I must go to this man, the recluse resolved. I must learn from him the way to become fully liberated. So he started walking from Bombay all uh, across all of central India and came at last to Savati, in which is the modern-day state of Uttar Pradesh in northern India. So this is very close to Nepal. And India, of course, is huge, so to walk all the way across India to get there, this was quite an undertaking. So this recluse was very serious. Um, and having arrived in Savati, he made his way to the meditation center of the Buddha and asked where he might find him. He has gone out, one of the monks replied. He's gone to beg for his meal in the city. And that's one of the facts about the historical Buddha that throughout his life, uh, upon uh, becoming the Buddha, he would go out every day and uh, beg for food. And he would just eat whatever was given to him. And that was his only meal of the day. And that's still a monastic tradition in, uh, in many cultures. Um, so he's gone to beg for his meal in the city, wait here and rest from your journey. He will return shortly. I, oh no, I cannot wait. I have no time to wait. Show me which way he has gone and I shall follow. Well, if you insist, there is the road he took 
If you like, you can try to find him along the way. Without wasting a moment, the recluse set off again and came to the center of the city. There he saw a monk going from house to house to beg for his food. The wonderful atmosphere of peace and harmony which surrounded this person convinced the recluse that he must be the Buddha. And asking a passerby, he found that it was indeed so. There in the middle of the street, the recluse approached the Buddha, bowed down and caught hold of his feet. Sir, he said, I am told that you are fully liberated and that you can teach a way to achieve liberation. Please teach this technique to me. The Buddha said, yes, I teach such a technique and I can teach it to you, but this is not the proper time or place. Go and wait for me at my meditation center. I'll soon return and teach you the technique. Oh no, sir, I cannot wait. What, not for half an hour? No, sir, I cannot wait. Who knows, in half an hour I may die. In half an hour you may die. In half an hour all of the confidence I have in you may die. And then I shan't be able to learn this technique. Now, sir, is the time. Please teach me now. The Buddha looked at him and saw, yes, this man has little time left. And he saw that he will die in just a few minutes. He was able to see this in the man. And the man sensed it himself. He must be given Dhamma here and now. And how to teach Dhamma while standing in the middle of the street. He spoke only a few words, but those words contained the entire teaching. He said, in your seeing, there should be only the seeing. In your hearing, nothing but hearing. In your smelling, tasting, touching, nothing but smelling, tasting, touching. In your cognizing, nothing but cognizing. When contact occurs through any of the six bases of sensory experience, there should be no valuation no condition perception. Once perception starts evaluating any experience as good or bad, one sees the world in a distorted way because of one's old blind reactions. In order to free the mind from all conditioning, one must learn to stop evaluating on the basis of past reactions and to be aware without evaluating and without reacting. The recluse was a man of such pure mind that these few words of guidance were enough for him. There, by the side of the road, he sat down and fixed his attention on the reality within. No valuation, no reaction. He simply observed the process of change within himself, and with a few minutes left to live, he attained the final goal, and he became fully liberated. So that's just a short story uh, from my teacher's book um, about the practice. And uh, I wanted to share that tonight because, of course, that sounds familiar because that's really what we're doing in our meditation practice as we go through. So this isn't like a, uh, a weird religious ritual or something that, um, that you're doing to take on a different faith, but this is really a technique that we're using to focus the attention, to let go of the ideas and the valuations, uh, and just have the raw experience. Letting go of our reactions, we start to cultivate equanimity within ourselves, and we develop this new habit. So it's, uh, it's very useful and it's very attainable. So I just wanted to share that story as we transition. Pardon me for a moment. So uh, tonight we'll continue with the series we've been doing on um, the ten paramis or the ten perfections. And so everyone has a, a new handout for tonight. Uh, and tonight's topic is Saka Parami, which is the perfection of truthfulness. Uh, and this may not be exactly what you think, but we'll go through it tonight. Um, so to review what we've talked about so far Dana Parami, which is the perfection of giving. Sila Parami, which is the perfection of virtue. Nakama Parami, which is the perfection of renunciation. 
Panya Parami, which is the perfection of discerning wisdom. Varaya Parami, which is the perfection of energy. Kanti Parami, which is the perfection of patience. And now this week, Saka Parami, which is the perfection of truthfulness. And we'll be continuing on with Aditana Parami, the perfection of determination. Metta Parami, which is the perfection of loving kindness. And finally, Upeka Parami, which is the perfection of equanimity. But for tonight, Saka Parami is the seventh of the ten Paramis. And the Pali word Saka is generally translated as truth and truthfulness. But it also means truth in accordance with reality and truth in accord with the way things are. So right away, when we think of truth, we usually think of speaking the truth or telling the truth. And that is correct. Those are correct aspects of this or correct characteristics of this Saka Parami. But then there is this other thing. Uh, the truth in accordance with reality and the truth in accord with the way things are. Sometimes we use the word Dhamma to describe that. Just a single word that kind of means truth in accordance with the way things are or truth in accordance with reality. That word Dhamma, D-H-A-M-M-A. -A. Uh, but this starts to lead us into an understanding that there's an aspect of wisdom to this practice as well. It's not just speaking the truth and telling the truth and abstaining from uh, falsehoods, but it is actually understanding, being aware, and observing reality as it unfolds in a way that leads to wisdom. Wisdom that transforms us and helps us to get free from suffering and its causes. So we'll talk about this in a little bit of detail in the next few minutes so it makes sense to everybody. Uh, Saka has, truthfulness, has the characteristics of being life-affirming, encouraging, healing, helpful, clarifying, and leading to happiness. So there's all these sort of soft, compassionate, uh, good feeling qualities to this, to this truthfulness, to this sakka. So this isn't a blunt, sort of brutal type of honesty. Um, this is an honesty that helps people feel free and peaceful and helps people to be well, helps people to be happy. And Saka, as the traditional way of describing this, Saka is perfected by the perfection that came before it, which is patience. If you're patient, you'll begin to really see with your own eyes what the truth is of reality you'll begin to develop real transcendent wisdom. Uh, so that is the perfection of Saka by patience. Being patient gives you that wisdom. And Kanti is also purified by Saka. The truthfulness that we develop, it gives us a, a greater sense of patience. And it gives us an understanding of the value of being patient, that there's something that pays off. So I wanted to divide this uh, Saka discussion into two parts. Part one is knowing truth. And then part two is going to be speaking truth. So we'll start with knowing truth. From the definition of Saka, we understand that speaking the truth is important. But we also need to discern truth as it manifests in our lives. And there's that word Dhamma again. Discerning truth as it manifests in our lives. That's another way of saying um, truth in accordance with reality or truth in accord with the way things are. So that's what Dhamma is. And that's why we call this, each Tuesday, we call this the Dhamma talk because now we're talking about the principles, we're talking about the theory, and then we, so each week we're doing theory and practice together. And theory and practice should always go together. 
So in the practice, there are what are known as the Four Noble Truths, uh, truths of which a deep understanding is essential to our liberation from suffering. So the way I look at this is, before you get to speaking the truth, or telling the truth, or exercising truthfulness, before you get to that part, there needs to be a knowing of truth. There needs to be a deep understanding of truth. You know, because how are you going to be able to tell the truth if you don't know the truth? So we have what are described in the practice as the four noble truths. These are the four things that we should know above everything else because these are really the, these are the framework of the practice. So the first, and I'm going to go through a couple of different paragraphs that are going to explain this. Uh, and many of you already know, and we've talked about this many times in many different ways, but it's so fundamental that it, you know, we could just about talk about this every single week, and that would be enough, because it's that important. So the first noble truth is the noble truth of suffering. The second noble truth is the noble truth of the cause of suffering. The third is the noble truth of the end of suffering. And the fourth is the noble truth of the path leading to the end of suffering. Okay, so what does that mean? How can we understand this in some terms that are practical? So restated, suffering exists. It has a cause. It has an end and it has a cause to bring about its end. And that cause, namely, is the Noble Eightfold Path. And the Noble Eightfold Path consists of right view, right intention, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration. But for now, let's just kind of focus on what this noble truth of suffering is. Every human being, every sentient being, uh, will experience, the word is dukkha in Pali, D-U-K-K-H-A, and we usually translate that word as suffering, but it really means a range of things. It could be something, you know, from mild agitation or mild stressfulness or worry on one end of the spectrum, and it could move to, you know, real anguish on the other end of the spectrum. Uh, real deep, intense fear or, or worry or despair or depression. So there's a spectrum. So suffering is kind of this catch-all word. But the truth of suffering is, is that we all experience it. Every human being experiences suffering. And of course, we all find suffering to be something that we'd rather not experience, right? I mean, that's kind of the natural reaction to it. Uh, so it's helpful to recognize first that, okay, suffering ex exists. When you isolate it and when you name it, that suffering exists, it leads us to the next thing, which is suffering also has a cause. There's a cause of suffering. Uh, the cause of suffering is what is known as craving. Okay, sometimes we call it attachment. And we'll get into that a little more in depth. The third uh, noble truth is that if there is an experience of suffering and we can isolate what the cause of that suffering is, that we should be able to eliminate that cause of suffering and experience what? The end of suffering. We should be able to experience cessation of suffering. And then the fourth is, there's a way to do that, a systematic way. And so namely, the, the Noble Eightfold Path, but really what those are, all of those eight things on the Noble Eightfold Paths are ways of purifying the mind. Purifying the mind, which then purifies our words, purifies our actions. But what we start to do is we start to act and think and live in a way that does not bring into existence the cause of more suffering. So we start, to, uh, we start to narrow it down, we start to thin it down. 
we start to experience more freedom, we start to feel better, and then we get on this cycle of, okay, yeah, this really works, so let me, let me bear down a little harder on the practice, let me focus on it a little more. So that's kind of what all this is leading to. So then uh, the next paragraph to describe it, so in other words, suffering is caused by craving. To let go of any amount of craving is to reduce one's suffering. Okay, so just imagine a moment when you had no craving, no aversion whatsoever. And, and what, what would that feel like? No craving, no aversion whatsoever. You're just here, you're just aware, you're just present. And if there's no craving and there's no aversion in this present moment, then there's a feeling of peacefulness. There's a feeling of equanimity, right? And that's a feeling where there is no suffering. So this is something that we can actually bring about and we can imagine the scenario. We can imagine this. What if I was able to let go of everything and just not be attached to anything? And we know instinctively that that's maybe not very realistic or not very practical, but just suppose, just imagine, it, what, it, what would it feel like if I could just let go of everything, let go of all of my reactions, right? What would that feel like? And it would, it would feel like tremendous freedom, tremendous peacefulness to just be able to let all of that go. And it goes back to that story that I read by my teacher, which is talking about, so in the things that you see, you know, there's just the things that you see. Just let that be the experience. You don't need to add anything additional to it, no evaluation, no judgment. You know, those are the things that are going to start to have the suffering. So just the experience. What would it be like if I could just let go of everything? And so now we know, yeah, that would be, that would be real freedom. That would be real peace. So now this isn't just some far off goal that, that's really lofty and maybe after meditating for years and years we get to be there. But this is something we can actually start to feel here and now, uh, maybe for short moments, maybe for short durations, but it will build and build and build. So we get the real feeling of it. Craving. Uh, I want to talk about what that is a little bit. Um, one of the things I sometimes use as a way of describing it and conveying it is if you can imagine being perfectly content, you know, let's just imagine you're, you're laying comfortably somewhere, you're perfectly content, your body is a perfect temperature. Um, you, you, you've had enough to eat. You're not thirsty. You're not tired. You know, everything is just like ideal. And there you are. And you're just, you know, I mean, maybe you're, maybe you're laying on an air mattress in a pool and everything is just perfect. Couldn't be better. And there you are. So picture yourself in the pool, in the pool on the air mattress, completely lounging, just enjoying it. Right? And then a thought comes up in the mind. I want a can of soda. Something simple, right? But as soon as this thinking, I want this, comes into your consciousness, what happens to that state of just pure equanimity? You know, it's a little bit disrupted. It's a little bit out of balance now, you know? You could think of it as just, you know, a can of soda. That's a simple thing. But I've had experiences, and everybody else has too, where you could be thinking about, I really want that can of soda, you know? In fact, I can no longer be satisfied just sitting here with the way things are. I need to get that. And when I do, then things will be satisfactory again, right? So we have this experience of the wanting mind, and sometimes it's kind of funny and silly to watch it because it can just be goofy things, you know. I want to find, you know, something on Netflix that I'll enjoy watching. And so, 
you'll start to look for it and the experience I have and I think other people do is I'll spend about two or three hours looking for something I want to watch and then it's time for bed and so I don't watch anything or I watch a movie that I don't particularly like but I've seen it a hundred times so you know things like this but these are examples the wanting mind it, something so simple as wanting a can of soda or maybe wanting something to eat or wanting to change the radio station. These are all little manifestations of what we call the wanting mind and they're just enough to create imbalance and sort of spoil that perfect equanimity of laying on the on the air mattress in the pool. Okay, so um, and I'm back to the handout here. Desire isn't the problem. Wanting isn't so much the problem as the way we desire or the intention. Uh, the word uh, chetana is the Pali word for intention, and that's uh, that's of all uh, that's of uh, great importance, because uh, what we don't want to do is confuse desire with being something that's wrong, right? Because what if your desire is to um, help other people? I mean, that's not wrong. Um, that's a wonderful desire. Or what if your desire is to learn how to meditate and do mindfulness, mindfulness practices so that you can be more peaceful and happier. I mean, that's wonderful. That's not wrong. That's not a bad thing. Uh, what if your desire is, oh, hey, I haven't eaten uh, lunch yet and I have a lot of work I need to do. I think I better go have lunch, you know, so you're hungry. You're desiring lunch. All of these things, perfectly normal desires, desires to help people, desires for... Um, food, desires for shelter, you know, all sorts of different things. Um, it's not that the desire is so much the problem, it's the intention or maybe the expectation um, behind the desire. So somehow we start to get this idea that if I, if I do that thing, that's really going to complete me and then I'll feel, you know, now I should feel good. You know, if I get that job, or if I get this career, or if I get this degree, uh, or if I get that partner, or if I get that, you know, whatever the case may be, we start to convince ourselves that these outside things possess, inherently possess, happiness. Uh, but because they don't, they are bound to cause us to suffer because we're looking for something in them that we cannot possibly get from them. So I'll read a little further. Craving and clinging, tana and upadana. And a lot of times the reason I put these in here, these Pali words, um, I like to use the Pali words and often I will go with the definitions of the Pali words. It gives us a little more insight into it. But I also like to do this so that if you are the kind of person that ever wants to study this in a little more detail, you could type in those poly words on a Google search and you would find all kinds of help, helpful stuff um, uh, to uh, be able to look at. So craving and clinging are the causes of our suffering. We can imagine how if we could let go of everything, just let go of all craving and clinging, we could be completely free from suffering but is it realistic or even possible to eliminate all desire? We need to have wholesome desire without attachment. So um, I put a couple examples in here. So now this again is we are, uh, we're understanding the truth, the reality, uh, the way things are. So um, I put in an example, maybe, uh, you have a relationship with a partner or you could use your career or you could use fill in the blank it doesn't really matter but I kind of started with what about my partner um, I'm completely attached to my partner and I don't want to give that up is that wrong Right? So we might say, I really love my partner and I don't want my partner to leave and they're an important part of my life and, and uh, uh, I love my partner and all that. Is that wrong? Nope, that's not wrong at all. But what if you're convinced that if your partner left you that you just couldn't go on? 
you know, that, that life would just be over. And, and some people really have that, that deep belief, right? So that's not an absurd thing to say. So that's not wrong. We're not talking about morally right or wrong here. We're just talking about, well, what, what causes us to suffer? So if we start to get these ideas about things um, that we're attached to them, to the extent that we're attached, that is the extent to which we will suffer when the object of our attachment ceases to be the way we want it to be. Right? So again, using the partner relationship, what if we are in a relationship and we're just not getting maybe the amount of attention that we feel that we need right now? Or the type of attention we're getting isn't the type that we want? You know, maybe we're looking for a certain type of intimacy or a certain type of, uh, of, of, of deep uh, conversation or something. You know, if we have this idea, this is the way I need it to be, and it isn't that way, then how does it feel? Well, it feels like suffering. It feels like dukkha, right? So again, that's not wrong. Nobody's judging you and saying, well, that's wrong. It's just saying, that's the fact of it. If you're attached to something, it's going to lead to suffering. It's going to lead to dukkha at some time, in some place, in some way, because the things we get attached to in these ways can never live up to the expectations that we have. Have you ever had expectations for a holiday? Uh, for Christmas to just be a certain way, you know, just kind of have this dream of it. Like that movie National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation where sort of the whole, the whole theme of the movie was that Clark Griswold wanted this old-fashioned family Christmas. He wanted everything to be perfect and uh, nothing quite worked out the way he wanted it to. It wasn't according to plan and so he was suffering throughout the whole movie. And then at the end of the movie, the realization was, kind of the moral of the story was, well, he had all these people around that they all loved each other and nobody really cared about the Christmas tree or the Christmas dinner. It was really more about being together. And so the moral of the story was, you know, it was fine all along, but it was, in this story, it was his attachment to these ideas that caused him to suffer. So kind of this, this, uh, this Buddhist element in that teaching, or this Dhamma element in, in, in that movie, I should say. Um, so there's just this awareness that we create these expectations, we create this, uh, these images in the wanting mind for how we want things to be, and the thing is, is that seldom can those things be that way. And so it's just setting up a recipe uh, for this dukkha or for this suffering. And then here's an observation. If you've been in a relationship with a partner, again, I'm using this, or it could be a career, maybe a job that you were really devoted to and you loved and uh, uh, you lost that job or you lost that career, we might say that after a certain amount of time grieving the loss of a partner or a relationship or a career, we no longer feel like we're suffering. You know, we go through this grieving process or this, uh, this period of, of sadness, excuse me. Um, and at some point in time we realize, you know, I'm not, I'm not suffering like I once was. So what is that? And it's simply because over the course of time, that grieving time, we've learned to let go of the attachment. Usually there's a whole, long, a whole lot of self-directed cognitive therapy taking place where we're saying, you know, we're, we're, we're sort of counseling ourselves, you know. Yeah, that ended and that was unfortunate, but it's going to be okay and each day is a little, you know, each day things generally are going in the right direction and getting better and you're going to be happy again and things will be okay again in the future. So over that grieving time, we've learned to begin to let go of the attachments and develop some skillful means or skillful approaches for dealing with our difficult emotions. So um, again, there's nothing wrong, you, you know, nothing morally wrong with being sad or depressed or worried or any of these difficult emotions. 
But we just need to know these are, uh, these are manifestations uh, of dukkha. These are manifestations of suffering. And so there's a cause. Suffering exists. Suffering has a cause. The cause is attachment. The cause is craving. Um, the cause is the flip side of craving, which is aversion. And that uh, when those causes are present, there is dukkha or suffering. And when those causes are no longer present, dukkha subsides, dukkha ceases. Uh, mindfulness practice shows us that we can desire things, but without the taints, there's three taints or three poisons or three root kalashas uh, in the teaching, and those are greed, hate, and delusion. So it is, it is said that all unwholesome emotions originate from one of these three roots. So like in the relationship, the wanting a certain type of attention, um, the wanting uh, uh, you know, certain actions to be done or things to feel a certain way on an ongoing basis, you know, that's just a little manifestation of the root of greed. You know, there's something, I want this, I want this, I want this. Greediness, not a moral, uh, uh, not a moral judgment, just an observation, objective. That's why this, you know, this truth of this is important to understand. So, uh, not moral judgment, just truth of the way things are. So when we start to understand that, it's like, oh yeah, you know, maybe I can't let go of everything, but there's a lot of stuff I think I can let go of. And each time I do that, I start to free myself up a little more. I start to feel a little better. And then I find when I feel better that I'm actually able to reach out and help other people a little bit. And then they feel better and I feel better because of that. So it's just these little examples. Yeah, I can let go a little, you know? I can let go a little. Today I can let go a little maybe of this one thing. Other stuff, not ready, and that's okay. Other stuff I'm not ready to let go, you can work on that tomorrow. You can work on that later. But if you can let go of something today, um, and it's okay to have desire, but we have desire without those taints of greed or hate or delusion. Or you could call it um, stinginess, ill will, um, lack of mindfulness, a refusal to uh, a refusal to accept the truth of the way things are. That's really what delusion is in, in the practice when we talk about that. So suffering is caused by craving for things like permanence in a world of impermanence. Right? I mean, we really look for permanence, but we all know this world is very impermanent, that our existence is impermanent. But we still look for permanence in a world of impermanence. That's delusion. We look for a self among non-self elements. Uh, to explain that, before I was using the example of, you know, if I get this career, I'll be happy. If I get this much money, I'll be happy. If I get that beautiful partner, I'll be happy. If I get this car, I'll be happy. Well, there is, we are craving for a self in non-self elements. That's really what that's talking about. This is stuff external to us, can't possibly satisfy us in any meaningful way. And then the third one is to, uh, to get lasting satisfaction in sense experiences which possess no inherent satisfactoriness. So here's how that works. Um, uh, this, this little bullet on lasting satisfaction in sense experiences which possess no inherent satisfactoriness. Just an example. Um, if you've ever had a favorite song, oh, I love that song. Every time it comes on the radio, and it's different now because it's not so much radio. I mean, when probably all of us grew up, you listened to the radio, and it was a matter of chance if your favorite song would come on, right? Now, because of all of our devices and we're all wired and connected, we, we can listen to the music we want to listen to. But as we grew up, it was kind of 
you know, oh, the radio's playing my favorite song. I love that song. And then uh, a lot of us would do what I would do, which is you go out and buy the record, right, or the cassette, and then you come home and you play that favorite song. And every time you play your favorite song or hear your favorite song, you felt so good, and it was like, this is wonderful, this is bliss, this is joy, right? And, um, but then that favorite song, maybe they play it over and over and over on the radio every couple of hours, and, and pretty soon that thing that was your favorite song is now something that is really quite annoying. It's like, you know, it goes from that was just something that was a source of happiness, and so we kind of think, oh, my favorite song, that is bliss, that's happiness, that's a source of happiness. And, but it really doesn't contain it. It's our attitude towards it, right? So that's just a simple thing. Another one might be, okay, uh, is ice cream a source of happiness? And if you could think about it, like right now, if you could go have your favorite ice cream, yeah, it'd be pretty yummy. Or if you could go to Dairy Queen and have, you know, a split or a, 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 a blizzard or whatever, your favorite it would be really yummy, right? Um, but is that, does it contain inherent satisfactoriness? Um, well, what if somebody else doesn't like that kind? For them, it doesn't. For you, it seems to. You know, so it's, it's not true of everyone. So that's an example that it doesn't have inherent satisfactoriness. Um, if you were a kid at Halloween, you got the right kind of candy. It was so good to eat one. Satisfactoriness, two satisfactoriness, 25, throwing up, sick, no more satisfactoriness. So these are just some kind of absurd, fun examples, but this is really, you know, this is a, one of the ways um, that we work with craving. Uh, so again, suffering is caused by craving for permanence in a world of impermanence a self among non-self elements, lasting satisfaction in sense experiences which possess no inherent satisfactoriness. And even though, in parentheses I have it there, even though we understand this to be true, we still think and behave as if it isn't. This is what is referred to as ignorance or delusion in the canon or in the suttas or the teachings. Uh, ignorance and delusion are opposite of truth. So, um, but knowing these three characteristics, uh, that the world is impermanent and that things are impermanent um, and that the elements that we can acquire, the ingredients of happiness, they're not really part of us. They're ideas we have about things that are outside of us and external to us and that um, we can't get lasting satisfaction from things that don't inherently possess satisfactoriness. If we go through our lives with that awareness, we transform those experiences. Because now we understand the truth of the way things are, and we approach them with a different kind of wisdom, right? So now, things that are impermanent, instead of becoming a problem, it's like, oh, look at this butterfly that landed on the flower, you know? And so there you are. This is just a few seconds. I get to watch this. This is wonderful. It's impermanent. So you're preaching, appreciating something impermanent. Or the eclipse as it comes through, you know, once every hundred years or whatever they say. Well, you know, you know that this is impermanent. If it happened constantly, I mean, you wouldn't really be interested in it. But this is impermanent. So we become aware that these impermanent things are impermanent. And so we change our attitude towards them we start to develop this appreciation for them. Um, we realize that non-self elements can never be true attributes of ourselves, but we can start to look at them in a way that we can appreciate what we have knowing that it's going to change. And that uh, sense experiences if we get attached to them and we rely on them as our source of happiness, because they don't contain happiness, we'll be disappointed. But if we just take, uh, take the happiness in the moment, 
the experience of mindfulness and presence, then we experience happiness. So um, that takes us through the first part, uh, and so uh, we're out of time. Uh, we're at 8.27 already, that went really fast. Um, so we'll pick up next week with part two of this, speaking truth. Um, but this first part has just been knowing truth. So before we conclude, let's see, there are a couple of things that I just wanted to mention. Uh, I started up a Facebook page. So if any of you are interested in that, I've been doing a, a post every day with a little saying, kind of a little uh, daily dhamma. Uh, so if you're interested, you can just find uh, Still Knowing Meditation Center on Facebook and you can follow it. Uh, and, uh, and then I also wanted to mention um, my contact information is always um, at the end of these handouts that everybody has. And I want to uh, invite anyone that, that wants to call me or email me or contact me in any way or stop by and visit. Um, I, uh, I am here uh, to do that. I love to be able to help people. I love to be able to answer questions. Um, I love to be able to help people through maybe sticky points in their meditation. So I just wanted to bring that up. You know, I'm, this is really, this is what I focus my life on. So, you know, feel free to contact me if I can help you in any way. Um, so now, before we leave, let's just take a moment. Uh, this is um, this is the customary way that we conclude our uh, our Tuesday nights together, our, our our Dhamma talks together, and that is just to take a moment to maybe let go of the teachings and kind of the you know usually our minds are really busy kind of chewing on this stuff and, and making sense of it, uh, and that's kind of fun. Uh, but it's helpful to let go of that for just a moment. And we're going to cultivate some very important intentions in our hearts and in our minds. And the first one is the intention of compassion. Uh, compassion for other living beings, whether it's people or animals or insects, any living beings. Uh, living beings desire to be free from suffering. And so we cultivate this wish for uh, the well-being of all living beings. May all beings be free from suffering and from its causes. And in addition to that, we wish that all beings can be surrounded by love and kindness. And we wish that all beings can be truly happy, truly joyful. And we wish that all beings can be equanimous, which means free and peaceful and in a state where they're not uh, bound up and craving and aversion, but they're just free and balanced and equanimous. We want that for all beings. And by wishing these things, by creating this intention within ourselves, we really are bringing this closer and closer to manifestation. These intentions are the beginning of the unfolding reality of these things in the world around us. And we're the conduits through which that takes place. And then finally, uh, may you sharing this space tonight with me, uh, to whom I am so deeply grateful, and I just really cherish the time that we spend together, may you all be truly, truly happy.